Okay, hello everyone and welcome to our Your Voice COVID Town Hall event. Uh, my name is Ellen McRae. If I haven't met you already, I'm your Students Association President. My pronouns are she, her, and I'll be hosting tonight's Town Hall event alongside my fellow sabbatical officers, Rachel Irwin, VP Activities and Services, pronouns are she, her, Amanda Scully, VP Community, pronouns are she, her, Fizzy Abu Jawad, who's VP Education, her pronouns are also she, her, and Neve McCrossan, who is our VP Welfare, her pronouns are also she, her. Since the first lockdown back in March, your Students Association have been working hard to represent you and secure the best experience for students. But we know that there's still a lot more to do and you've got questions. So tonight we are providing a platform for you us to get together and directly ask these questions to senior university staff who are the people making these decisions about your student experience. So just before we get started, please note if you need captionings to participate in this evening's event, you can switch them on by clicking the three options um, dot at the top of your screen and then pressing the CC button. And if you have any issues hearing or engaging with the session, please message Stuart Lamont. We are also recording tonight's event for your future reference, but only those appearing on screen will be recorded and your comments and questions will not be included in this recording. And of course, this session is covered by our meeting code and conduct and safe space policy. These are in place to create an environment where all students and staff feel welcome, respected and fully able to participate. It is our collective responsibility to follow and uphold these policies. We recognise tonight that we'll be covering topics that you may feel passionately about, but abuse, aggression, harassment, discrimination and violence are completely unacceptable. If you feel uncomfortable during this session, then again, please do message Stuart Lamont. Um, we ask that also any questions that you might submit tonight in the live Q&A function, um, we respectfully ask that these are kept in line with these safe space policy also. And if we receive any questions in breach of this, we will not be able to ask them. So tonight we're providing you with the opportunity to ask these questions directly to senior university staff, either through questions that you've already submitted in advance or through the live submitted questions feature. Based on student feedback that we've already had, uh, we'll be covering the following themes, which are COVID-19 restrictions, tuition fees and teaching, IT and library resources, accommodation, and if we have time, we'll be able to pick up any other questions as well. You'll be able to submit your questions through the live Q&A feature by typing them in the box, and we will publish questions relating to the topic we're currently discussing. So you'll have the opportunity to vote on questions you want to be answered by university senior leadership by clicking the thumbs up button. We appreciate that some of these questions might be quite similar, so upvoting on questions you um, want to hear back from uh, will really help us choose those most important to address. I'd like to thank all of our speakers who have been able to join us on this panel tonight to address the questions that you have. Um, I will quickly introduce them to you now but you'll be able to see them on the screen uh, later in the event. Firstly, I really want to thank our principal, Peter Matheson, for joining us. Peter uses he, him pronouns, and he is the principal and vice chancellor of the University of Edinburgh. We Hi. also have... Thanks, <laughs> thank you, Peter. We also have Colm Harmon with us. Colm uses he, him pronouns, and he is the vice principal of students. Next is Tina Harrison. Tina uses she, her pronouns and is the Assistant Principal Academic Standards and Quality Assurance. Thank you to Gavin Douglas also, who is the Deputy Secretary for Student Experience. Gavin uses he, him pronouns. Next, we also have Catherine Martin. Catherine uses she, her pronouns and is the Vice Principal of Corporate Services. Finally, we also have Gavin McLaughlin, who is the Vice Principal and Chief Information Officer and Librarian to the University and uses he, him pronouns. Thank you again to all of our panellists tonight, but I will promptly pass over to Neve, our Vice President Welfare. Hi everyone. 
So first, we're going to take two pre-submitted questions under the themes of COVID-19 restrictions. COVID-19 has obviously had a really large impact on this academic year, and we know that many of you will still have plenty of concerns about the restrictions in place and what this may mean for you. So our first pre-submitted question is, can I ask what you're doing regarding the students breaching COVID rules? Considering the incredibly high occurrence of students, particularly those living in student accommodation, consistently uh, breaking lockdown and distancing rules, when will the university take decisive action against these students? We were told that students would be suspended. However, in most instances, university staff do not bother to identify these students at all. And in the few instances where students are fined, the fines are minimal. These are actual laws being broken. When is the university going to take action to protect the students and staff that are actually following the guidelines? So I'm going to hand this question over to Peter and to Gavin Douglas to answer this question. Thank you very much, Neve. So uh, this is Peter Matheson. I'll, I'll go first and then I'll ask Gavin to, uh, to pick up if that's OK. Um, so first of all, thank you very much to uh, everybody for organising it and to all of those that are attending. It's a great opportunity for me and for some of my colleagues to, to talk to you. Um, and I would just preface my remarks by just uh, commenting that we are all very sorry that, that, that our students' experience of university, whether you're new students or returning students, has been so disrupted uh, in the last couple of months. Uh, all of our lives have had the, uh, been turned upside down by this pandemic and uh, and, and we do recognise the impact that that's had and is continuing to have on people. So we're very sorry about that. Um, in response to this particular question, um, I'd answer in two ways. Firstly, I think the university needs to be proportionate in its response to all aspects of behaviour. Um, and I would say that my email inbox is about 50-50 in terms of the number of messages I've had complaining that we're being too draconian and the number that I've had complaining that we're not being draconian enough. Um, uh, so it's it's a, it's an equal balance, uh, I think, in terms of the messages I've received. The wording of this question is very much of the not draconian enough uh, type uh, angle. And what I would say to that is that we are trying to, to uh, um, encourage uh, the behaviours that we want to see, on mostly on the grounds of safety, health and safety of members of the community. And in the Student Code of Conduct, which Gavin knows far more about than I do, um, uh, one of the uh, stipulations is that uh, an action which um, uh, risks the health and safety of another member of the community is, is a breach of that conduct. And so that's very much the line that we're taking. We are not the police, and so therefore we're not um, uh, seeking to replace the function of the police. And obviously the police have been involved uh, when called either by us or very often actually by students um, to uh, the accommodation uh, and the police have got their approach, which uh, consists of, a, of an escalating approach of uh, trying to encourage compliance, trying to advise, trying to educate uh, before moving to sort of enforcement. They've got this sort of staged approach, which they've been applying to us in the same way as they do to other members of the community. And I think the university has been trying to take the same sort of approach, trying not to be uh, too ready to use um, uh, strict measures of discipline or, or, or even fines but being prepared to do so when we think they're justified. And I suppose the question is a, a subject of judgment of when that's justified. Some of it is about repeat offenders, offenders and, um, and some of it's about degree. If I cite one example, um, one thing I've heard about, which I think was completely unacceptable, was a warden in one of the halls being injured when the door that she was opening was kicked and it injured her in the process. In my opinion, that's completely unacceptable and should be punished. Um, there are other examples of things where the barrier between what's acceptable and what's not acceptable is much more grey. But I think there are some things which are clearly not acceptable and should be punished and we're aiming to punish them. And I think anything which endangers health and safety, and I would include uh, blocking up of smoke alarms or, or for triggering of fire alarms and whatnot in the same sort of category. So with that general uh, answer, I've used up two and a half minutes and I'll pass over to Gavin. Peter, thanks very much. So just to sort of expand on that a little bit further. Um, I agree, obviously, with everything you said in terms of proportionality. The uh, One of the things that the question says is we're not actually very good at identifying people. The example that Peter's just given of the warden who was injured when the door was kicked in is actually a very good example. What the warden saw was somebody running away down the corridor who they could not identify and therefore were not able to take any action from the evidence we've got in that particular case at the moment. So it is often quite difficult to find out who is the perpetrator of some of these things and sometimes we're not able to take action as a result. But nor is it the case, uh, I should stress, that we're not doing anything. So I pulled together the stats 
going back some 10 days um, to the 21st of October. Uh, I've got 132 different incidents um, referred here. Um, of those, a number have had no action because it's not been possible to identify the uh, students concerned. Um, but in 54 cases, that's 40% of the cases, uh, the students have been issued with a fine and the fines range from 50 to 150 pounds. And I think the judgment is whether that is an insignificant fine depends very much on your personal uh, financial circumstances. Certainly a lot of students um, have protested very loudly uh, against the level of fines that we're imposing. I should also say that there have been seven cases now. There were four last week, another three this week so far, um, which have gone beyond the fining process and into our formal code of student conduct processes, which is where uh, the potential end game is an appearance in front of the discipline committee, where those kinds of sanctions such as suspension, exclusion, etc., can be considered. So we certainly are taking uh, action seriously. We're, we're doing it in a proportionate way. It starts with fines typically. But, but where we have evidence of serious breaches or where we have evidence of repeated breaches, we're moving into formal disciplinary procedures with the risk of exclusion or suspension at the end of that. So um, it is happening. Uh, it's also not a very visible process. We don't shout about the numbers of students or the identities of students concerned, um, but that process is well underway and those stats, I hope, provide um, evidence of that. Thanks very much. Um, and I'm sure all the students will really appreciate um, you being so transparent um, with your figures and stats there. Uh, moving on to the second pre-submitted question. Um, what is the situation going to be with going home for Christmas and coming back safely in January? I know that currently it's very hard to definitively say anything um, and the government conversations are obviously still ongoing, but it would be great to highlight to the students all of the options and plans that um, the university are currently exploring. So. I think I'll pass back to Peter and Gavin to discuss this question. Thanks very much, Neve. Um, yeah, so you're right, it's not uh, possible to give an absolutely clear answer to this question because so much of the work is still ongoing. I would say two or three things. I mean, firstly, because we're um, uh, in a devolved nation and education is a devolved uh, um, policy issue, then most of our discussions are with Scottish government. But because I'm a member of the Russell Group Board, I also get involved with discussions with UK government. So I've been involved in discussions with both. And there is um, uh, there is an attempt to make sure that the government policies in the four devolved nations, in the three devolved nations of the four nations of the UK are aligned. And so it's a bit complicated for us because uh, there's more than one government involved. But primarily we're dealing with Scottish government. What I would say is that Scottish government is extremely concerned to ensure that people can enjoy Christmas as close to normal as possible in the circumstances, including being able to be wherever they want to be, wherever they want to be with. Um, that could mean staying in Edinburgh, or it could mean going home, or it could mean going somewhere else. Um, that has implications in terms of creating a new household, and I think the the government is very sympathetic to the need to uh, un to, to to allow people to create a new household for the Christmas period. They're very very concerned about that. Um, I would say that they're more concerned about that than they have been so far about what happens in January. And, and I and my colleagues have all been saying, can we please also discuss uh, after Christmas? We don't want to just make a policy for going home at the end of term. We want to make a policy for coming back after Christmas because we aim to continue to provide a blended experience next term, um, subject to whatever the situation with the pandemic is and what, you know, what degree of lockdown we're having to deal with. We would, we would steadfastly believe that there are advantages to people to being here. Um, and so we don't want to just talk about going home because we want to talk about coming back afterwards. It's likely that the return to campus uh, after Christmas will be staggered between different universities. As it currently stands, three of the four universities in Edinburgh have the same start date. And we, and we, the University of Edinburgh, also has the same start date as the other big university in Scotland, which is the University of Glasgow. And it doesn't make a great deal of sense to all have the same date. So it may well be that they're staggered. And then the final thing, which was again still not subject to certainty, but very much part of the discussion is the role that testing will play. Um, and whether uh, the government will be able to provide asymptomatic testing to guide people in their decision making about whether to go home, particularly if they've got um, relatives or other people that they will be with over Christmas who have uh, shielding needs or other health concerns. So, so we hope that there will be some level of testing available to help guide some of the decision making. Um, but at the moment, the details of that are not particularly clear. Gavin, I don't know if you've got anything to add to that. Uh, 
Apologies, my microphone button proving sticky there. Um, just to add that uh, we do expect wh whatever the Scottish Government announces, uh, we obviously want uh, as many of our students who want to go home for Christmas uh, and can do so safely to be able to do so. That's that's what we hope. Uh, the Scottish Government will help us with the guidance around that. But we do expect there to be a, a significant number of students who are unable to go home for Christmas, perhaps because flights are too expensive or because travel restrictions are still in place. Uh, and we are working on plans to provide additional support for students who stay in Edinburgh and in the university accommodation over the Christmas period. So we'll be announcing uh, further details of that uh, in the weeks to come. And that's the only other uh, comment I'd make, Peter, in addition to what you just said. Thanks very much. Um, so we'll just turn to the questions that have been submitted tonight by our participants. Um, so looking at one that has four likes currently, what is the student, what is the university doing to support new students to help us make friends and meet people on our courses when we have no face to face teaching? Um, I'll direct this one to Peter and then if anybody else feels like they'd like to answer it, um, they can come on in. OK, so um, I think Gavin's probably better place to answer this than me, Gavin D. But I, uh, again, my general point would be we're doing uh, we, firstly, we recognise the significance of the issue. Um, secondly, we recognise that um, there's a there's the, there's what goes on in the classroom and there's what goes on outside the classroom. Um, and we believe that both of those things are very important components of the university experience, including making new friends and making uh, long term relationships, some of which may turn into lifelong uh, friendships. Um, and so we're trying to do everything we can to facilitate those. It's all got to be done in the context of the health and safety advice. So um, avoiding large gatherings and avoiding um, uh, being in close proximity to other people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but we've invested in social spaces uh, around the university, including the one in Bristol Square and the one at King's Buildings. Uh, we're trying to provide online materials to support uh, uh, the various uh, ways in which people can meet other people. And of course, I should say that you, sir, themselves do a tremendous amount uh, to support this particular aspect of, of student well-being. So um, uh, that would be my general comment, but Gavin, say a bit more in detail. So I, th I think this is the big challenge to be, well, perhaps it's one, one of the big challenges for this semester is how, how do you actually um, create opportunities for social contacts uh, in a time of pandemic when uh, social contacts are so limited um, by the guidance, the rule of six and so on. Um, as Peter has said, there's a, a number of initiatives already taken place, such as the creation of social spaces. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that most of the activity that's happened uh, in the in the making friends space so far has been led by the student societies through the Students Association and the sports clubs and societies that have been incredibly active through the sports union. Uh, and those have always been uh, and as always will be one of the most important ways for people to, to make social connections uh, outside their, their households, uh, outside their course groups and so on. Um, Peter mentioned the social spaces. Um, we've recently uh, started some work on looking at how we can make better use of those social spaces. Um, how can we encourage more people to use those social spaces? Uh, so our team and accommodation are working on a, a number of schemes to try and um, make it easy for people to get into those spaces. To, well, they're easy to get into already, uh, to make it more attractive to get into them, um, to uh, incentivize people to meet up with friends and, and other new acquaintances in those spaces. And again, I hope we'll have details of that scheme being announced in the, in the next few days uh, and there'll be incentives um, you know, around sort of free coffees and chocolates and things to help people do that. So a number of initiatives going on, but I do recognise, um, and I think we all do, that this is one of the most challenging aspects um, of life uh, in Edinburgh at the moment. And uh, uh, we'll carry on trying to find creative and innovative ways to, to have opportunities for people to meet together whilst recognising that the restrictions are very tough. Thanks very much. Um, I think we'll just go with one more question and then we'll move on to our next topic. So um, where are the legal grounds for the university fining students £150 under which law specifically? Um, I'm not sure if um, someone from accommodation maybe wants to take this or... Um, Gavin, Gavin D is volunteering, Neve. Yeah, I think I'll take that one. Um, somebody asked a similar question at a town hall we held last week, so, so I, have, I have answered this one before, I'll answer it again. Um, when uh, any student uh, enrols at the University of Edinburgh, they sign something called the Sponsio Academica, uh, that's part of the enrolment process, and the Sponsio Academica, uh, which has now been translated in, into English, so it's quite easy to understand, um, says that all students uh, submit themselves to the authority of the University Senate. 
Uh, one of the powers that the University Senate has is the maintenance of good order and discipline in the university. Uh, and the way it uh, ensures that there is good order and discipline in the university is by approving the Code of Student Conduct. Um, the Code of Student Conduct sets out a range of um, uh, processes, penalties uh, and um, sanctions that um, discipline officers can apply and that the discipline committee can apply. Uh, and that's all sanctioned by Senate. So the short answer is by enrolling at the university, um, you submit yourself to the authority of Senate. Senate has power over discipline. Senate has put that power into the Code of Student Conduct. That's where these fines are set out. Uh, and that's the legal basis for the um, application of those fines. Um, I hope that answers the question succinctly. Thanks very much for clarifying that, um, Gavin. So now we're going to move on to our next section uh, with Fizzy, our VP Education. Thank you, Neve. Um, so all students this year have experienced a huge change um, to their teaching provisions, with most students receiving the majority, if not all, of their teaching online. Um, those students largely appreciate the hard work that staff have put in um, to this transition. There is a sense of frustration among students about what hybrid teaching looks like in practice. This frustration has led to an influx of questions regarding tuition fees and more specifically requests for tuition fee refunds. So I'm going to ask two pre-submitted questions um, about tuition fees and teaching provisions. Um, so the first question is from a postgraduate taught student um, in the College of Science and Engineering. As a science student, we are paying extra money for the MSI to have access to the labs, which we are not getting. We have been promised labs in the second semester, but it keeps on being we are doing our best and the wet labs for our dissertation seem like an option nobody wants to talk about. If labs are not possible, shouldn't the tuition fee be decreased proportionally? I'm going to open up to anyone on the panel who'd like to answer. Happy to fizzy. Hi, um, everybody. Colm here. And uh, my thanks to, to Yusa and all of the team for getting this uh, event going. Um, so it's, look, it's a great question, and I think tuition fees more broadly, but and, and this particular kind of more nuanced aspect of the fee question is one that has has been kind of pushing around a bit. So let me try and kind of deal with it with a kind of couple of aspects of of tuition fee uh, issues in 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 one go. I mean, I think first off, you know, the 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 the, the sort of correlation of of the fee um, to the direct tuition experience is 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 not quite getting it right. The university is providing um, estates that the buildings we're in, the people teaching uh, and all other aspects of what we're trying to do as an institution um, as as part of that fee. So there isn't this simple, um, as simple a correlation between the fee paid. Even, even saying that though, um, it, it hasn't uh, been cheaper if you want to think of it that way uh, to, to put this academic year in place. In fact, if anything, uh, this academic year is, is as expensive or uh, costs the same, if not more, uh, than than a regular teaching year is. So the university is not in a position to sort of reduce the tuition fee. Um, it's, if anything, because of what we're trying to do is deliver a learning outcome. And that's the key issue for us, that we, we're designing the programmes to deliver the learning outcomes that you uh, all rightfully uh, want and expect um, from us. And it's not it's not clear, in fact, that that costs us any less, if you think. So we can't pass those kind of costs on in a very easy way. So I think part of it is a is a sort of a, a, a misconception of of what the fee is and that and that direct relationship between uh, a fee and a person standing in front of you in a classroom. It, it's the, the fee at the university is to cover a lot of aspects of how the university operates. Uh, and in delivering this academic year, we have faced all of those costs and and more. And, and that's that's the sort of issue for us. I think in terms of the the sort of differentials, um, I, I was interested in getting this question earlier, and I, I kind of looked to check. It, maybe it, it's difficult to know without knowing a sort of precise programs. There is a differential, for example, between programs in AHSS and and science and engineering, and maybe that's reflecting a perception that that this is a kind of a lab fee or bench fee. But again, it's the published tuition fee for the program and the key issue to come back to my point earlier is whether or not the learning outcome is being delivered if 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 as i hope uh, labs are being planned and that the, the school is saying that the, the labs are being planned then that's part of their 
plan in relation to delivering the learning outcomes. And certainly, uh, and I know this is a question that's that's bubbling up on the Q and A um, uh, side of the of the of the event. Um, certainly, our plans and our conversations with schools in semester two are entirely focused on ensuring that those learning outcomes are delivered. We are. We have to make sure that given the constraints are still in operation and they haven't gone away, that we ensure that we focus first on whether it be labs or whether it be any other dimension of the learning experience, that we focus on learning outcomes as a priority uh, to be delivered. So first off, I would say bear with the schools. They are working through these, these issues uh, and are working through them very hard. Uh, labs have been a particularly acute problem um, for our schools uh, in the context of social distancing. It hasn't stopped them happening uh, completely across uh, across different uh, schools and programs that use labs and practical spaces and studios, but they have been a particular challenge. And as I say, uh, we're working through now with those schools to sort of free up as best we can the additional space and resource to allow uh, those labs and other practical um, uh, interactive uh, courses to happen. So I'd say bear with the schools, they're working hard to make them happen and uh, they have in a sense designed the course to deliver on the learning outcomes and if that's what they've said they're going to do then they'll do it. Thank you Colm. Um, moving on to our second pre-submitted question of the same theme. Um, so I do realise that some of your answer may still stand for this question, Colin. Indeed, yeah. um, So some programmes are offered online at a base price that is the same for both domestic and international students. If the programmes this year are now entirely online, why have the prices not been changed to reflect that of an online programme? And specifically, why are international students still having to pay more? Yeah, thanks, Susie. And again, thanks for the question. I mean, again, I think there's a distinction here. And Gavin, I think Gavin McLaughlin is is on the call, and 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 I'm hogging the the, the spotlight here. Tina, um, feel free to jump in if you want on anything on this point. Um, uh, I think the question is is distinguishing between our our online programs, you know, degree programs that have been designed from the ground up as a sort of distance learning and online programs uh, versus the, the the programs which are built around um, uh, the hybrid learning, uh, built around uh, students being here and, and built around a plan over the course of the academic year across both semesters to, 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 uh, to sort of be flexible about how we deliver and in a sense, the design of the programs, it, to draw a distinction, if you like, between uh, a, a program designed from the ground up and, and what we've been doing uh, in, in the hybrid programs is that we were, in a sense, largely trying to kind of re recognize the fact that some students were constrained in not being here for whatever reason. And the, the sort of online elements was about delivering tuition uh, and delivering on the learning outcomes to those students uh, off the back of, of fundamentally a campus based program. So you have students here, we'd have students constrained and not able to be here. And how do we how do we deliver a program for both sides? The other programs are designed as online programs. They have very different designs. They have very different uh, structures in terms of assessment and so on, um, and have, have different kind of motivators and, and instincts. But Gavin may be able to jump in. Gavin McLaughlin may be able to jump in and say a little bit more on that front. Gavin, muted. But what a classic error. Uh, sorry about that, muted. Um, the uh, I, th I think there there might be uh, somewhat of a misperception uh, with regards to our online courses. Of course, the University of Edinburgh offers about 60 uh, online uh, courses. We did so uh, pre-COVID and have done uh, for over 10 years. These are predominantly postgraduate taught courses, uh, uh, master's degree courses, uh, and the pricing of those, uh, the university prices those at the same price as we would price online courses. Uh, and that's because uh, the quality is the same uh, and the degree you receive at the end is the same. Uh, and we don't make a distinction. We made a, a deliberate choice as a university that we wouldn't make a distinction between online students and on campus students and the awarding of a, a degree that you earned online, in this case, a postgraduate taught degree and one that you received on campus. There are a few cases where we do have short courses 
MOOCs and other courses uh, that are at a lower cost. Uh, but that's because they don't uh, uh, award you at the end a degree. Uh, so the reality is uh, that I think uh, there's a misperception about online courses costing less. Uh, of course, the universities all over the world uh, price their courses uh, at different prices. Uh, but for ours, the standard uh, that we have here at the University of Edinburgh is we price our online degrees, which result uh, in an online degree uh, at the same as we would for on campus courses. Thanks, Gavin. Tina, did you want to um, come in at all as well? Yes, yeah, happy to uh, add to that. Um, really just to add what you were saying earlier, Colm, about the different models of our wholly online programmes versus the hybrid version that we're, that we're operating now. And I can really appreciate that from a student's point of view, it might be very hard to understand the distinction between a wholly online programme that's been delivered to be, to be um, uh, it has been designed to be delivered wholly online versus the online experiences that some of our students are having now. And, and as Gavin has highlighted, most of these are postgraduate students, mature students. A lot of them are, are in the, um, the uh, College of Medicine and Veterinary Medicine, where these are individuals who are already in their professions. So the level of support, the level of interaction that these students require and get from the university is, is often very different compared with the uh, on-campus provision that we offer and also the ways in which we have pivoted to some of the hybrid and online provision, which which partly explains why why we have the different um, fees uh, to the way in which we organise things. Uh, and I know I appreciate that's very difficult, I think, from a student to to really appreciate why there might be a, a differential pricing structure, but it, but they are quite different in the nature of the design and the kind of the, the targets that, that, that we are aiming those online programmes at as well. Thanks, Tina. Um, Fizio, if I might indulge for a sec, just to extend out a little bit further this, because I'm, I'm conscious that it may be coming through on the on the chat too. So to go back on the, the point about kind of learning outcomes and so on, as I, as I said, what, what I what I'm saying is that you know, the, the, the programs and courses, the, the schools have designed the delivery of their programs to deliver those learning outcomes. And, and the question, I see one question going further on the on the kind of lab question uh, that it'll disadvantage you in terms of further study and careers. I mean, the question for me will be the, the schools will be, as I said, bear with them. They are working through doing what they had promised and committed to do uh, in delivering the program. Um, if you feel that there isn't that access to lab being provided and there isn't, you know, alternative tuition uh, that is, you know, at the same as if not uh, or, uh, or delivering the same experience, then that is an issue to take up firmly with the school. I'm not saying that there isn't an issue here to address at some point, but what I am saying is that the schools are working hard against those constraints to deliver uh, lab practicals and other types of, of, of practical classes across the sciences and humanities. Um, we are working with them on their plans for semester two right now and uh, working through the timetabling and other assumptions. Um, and as I said, they have designed their programs. The very, pro the very reason we worked with the schools to allow them to design how they deliver their degree programs rather than sort of imposing some central model was that they are best able to ensure that those learning outcomes are met. Um, of course, if you feel they're not, that's a, that's a conversation you, you should legitimately have with the school. Uh, and that's, that's an important message to give across as well. Thanks, Fizzy. Yeah, thank you, Colm. So I think I'm going to take one question from the um, live Q&A box. Um, and this question is on about learning and teaching rather than tuition fees. Um, so given that, that the delivery of learning and teaching is devolved by the central university to schools and colleges, do you think it was right for the university's central communications to advertise that students were being given hybrid learning when some schools had decided they would offer they wouldn't offer any in-person teaching earlier in the summer? How are you going to fix this communications problem for semester two? 
And I'm again happy for whoever would like to answer that. Well, I'm happy again to jump in. Um, uh, thanks. Um, uh, thanks for the question. Yeah, look, I, I absolutely feel um, it was the right issue for us to to approach. I mean, I said we, we, we could look at the way in which different institutions uh, decided to plan and develop this year. And, you know, we could have said, you know, every student will have, you know, a number, one hour, two hours, whatever it is of face to face interaction. We, we chose and I think this is the right way to do it to allow schools um, to make that choice. What that has delivered uh, is is a sort of somewhat heterogeneous outcome. We have schools who are, where there's quite a lot of face to face and, in, and synchronous, if we can use that sort of buzzword happening uh, and some schools uh, where that's not. It's not really the case that that was decided sort of early in the summer. There are issues which happened late in the academic year to some schools. Um, the A-level issues, for example, created additional pressures on spaces in certain dimensions and in certain schools and certain and programs. And uh, the, uh, the additional pressures on a state that changes in Scottish government guidelines uh, which were trending in one direction uh, for, for a long period of the summer and then trended back to being quite uh, quite hard in relation to the two meter distancing also created. But we are looking across the full academic year. And as I said, we, we are seeing, and are listening to the students who are telling us this, we are, we are seeing programs where frankly, uh, you know, the, the level of face-to-face -face and synchronous activity has fallen to a very low level. And that is something that those schools are aware of. They're certainly aware of my views in relation to that. And it is something we're actively working on with those schools. So I don't uh, want to see um, a situation where that sort of where, where students who are feeling they're getting very little uh, synchronous or in-person activity. Uh, um, I don't want to see that continuing into semester two. We are we're facing exactly the same constraints in terms of uh, campus capacity and all those kind of things. Um, so we have, we're working to be as creative as we possibly can. But I think it's been a really important aspect of the feedback from events like this and other activities that we've had with, with students, town halls and various other things to really try and, um, and see what it is that is, is, is most wanted um, uh, from the students. And the message we've got you know, through, through, through the USA team and through other events is that what you most want is that degree of, of synchronous activity, which could be digital, could be face to face, but it's that sense of bringing this, the student community together in some form is, is what you feel is missing. And I think that's an issue that's missing acutely in some programs more than others. So the key task for me, if you like, in, in terms of the university, so the central position on that is to try and smooth out that um, different that difference that is existing across programs. Some programs are flying ahead and doing a lot of uh, a lot of face to face and 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 synchronous digital activity, and some programs aren't. So task one: Can we raise that bottom level up? Can we can we make sure that more of that is happening? And that's a clear message we've got from you right the way through the, the semester, and one that we are hearing. And two: Where we can, can we can we work harder to improve? the sort of broader student experience, uh, other activities associated with the discipline, bringing the community of students together. I said in an earlier communication that one of the unexpected challenges, uh, unexpected from my point of view, in, in thinking through lots of things about this semester, the one that, I, that caught me a little bit more by, by surprise was the combination of physical constraints, the combination of, of, of um, uh, other constraints that schools found themselves under, but also that, um, particularly those living in, in, in our halls, the sort of definition of a household being very different to every other year. In the, you know, and so students have had this kind of perfect storm of things that we have to try and counteract. So, so we're certainly wanting to see more of that. I think some programmes simply won't be able to do more. And in fact, some programmes are doing quite a, quite a hefty amount of, of contact. Our job really, for my job as I would see it, is to try and raise the, the average. And the, the way we best likely to try and do that is to work with schools who are doing little right now in the face-to-face -face or synchronous space and try and get that up. And that's something that's very actively being worked on right now. It's, it's probably not an answer that can be as definitive as we might like right at this point in time, but it is something that we're really working on. Um, Tina, you did want to say something about accreditation and, and those kinds of issues. Do you want to briefly come back in there on that? So 
Yeah, I, yes, it was just for those students that are concerned that they're not getting enough um, lab time, for example. And, and I know that there is a student experience aspect to that, that students want to acquire those lab skills. But the other dimension to that is the the skills that are required by the professional bodies and we are working with the professional bodies. All of the schools are working with their respective professional bodies to make sure that where uh, certain skills are required, whether that's in the lab or whether that's a different kind of skill, that um, that that those can be delivered where 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 they can be delivered or where they can't be delivered because of restrictions that those adjustments are being made and they're being recognized recognised by those professional bodies as well. So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you both. Um, so I think on that note, uh, we'll be moving on to Rachel, who is going to be taking some questions um, about IT and library resources. Thanks, Fizzy. Uh, so as Fizzy has alluded to, with the move to a hybrid teaching model and with much learning and teaching now occurring online, students' engagement with IT and library resources has become ever more crucial. With the reconfiguration and creation of study spaces, the new study space booking system, the CTED app, and many of our students who are not in Edinburgh this semester needing to access resources remotely, IT and library resources is an issue on which we've received a large volume of student feedback this semester. So I'm now going to take uh, two questions that were pre-submitted and I'm happy for any of our panellists to answer, though appreciate it's probably more of Gavin McLaughlin's remit. So the first question is from a third year undergraduate English literature student who asks, due to the nature of my uh, degree, a lot of our coursework reading is only available in physical copies in the library. I'm currently studying remotely and I've emailed the library to ask if they could scan a few pages of text for me to which they told me they could not. I don't think it's fair at all for us, given that we're paying the same fees as all other international students to be excluded from using all available library resources, particularly when they're useful to our understanding of the course material. Would the university commit to employing more staff in order to facilitate scanning services for remote students? particularly given the concerning trajectory of the epidemic in the UK and the likelihood of a continuation of online learning for the majority of students. Yes, thanks, Rachel. Um, I, and uh, a really good question. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, I'd just like to apologize to the student who's had difficulties. Uh, I think that uh, there are a number of students in your particular case, uh, we're uh, running up against the issue of physical books in the library. So let me address that. So first and foremost, we recognized and anticipated the challenge that we would face uh, as we entered hybrid education. Um, and we conducted a large scale program to convert as much of the core teaching material to digital as we can. Uh, we made a very large investment uh, of over uh, 250,000 pounds to convert core teaching material to digital material where we could, where there was a digital uh, alternative. Uh, now, unfortunately, uh, we weren't able to convert all the core uh, material to digital as some is only available in paper form or has other copyright restrictions on this. I realize this specific question is about the rarer types uh, of material, particularly secondary reading and resource materials, and in this particular case uh, in physical form. So what we have is we have several options available uh, for students. Um, I, I can confirm that the library does provide a scan service that allows us uh, in some cases to scan chapters and parts of books at your request uh, and provide those electronically to you. And I think your request is a very legitimate one to provide more resources so that we can provide that service faster. Uh, and we will be going ahead and dedicating more resources and more staff so that we can do that scan to digital service for remote stu uh, students like yourself. Now, I'd like to just go ahead and set perceptions though uh, that that won't work in all cases. Now, the way that we're able legally to scan a printed book and provide it to you digitally is through something called the National CLA Copyright License. And unfortunately, that license limits the numbers of books 
and the amount of books that we can go ahead and scan and provide to you. Typically, the scanning limits are usually either one chapter or 10% of a particular book, whatever is greatest. Also, not all of our physical library books are covered by the CLA license. And finally, some academic publishers do not allow any scanning of their print books at all, uh, which makes life very difficult. So what we've done is we've looked at some other alternatives to help you out. One thing that we've done is we've just recently launched our click and deliver service, which is initially being piloted in Pollock Halls, and that will deliver the physical library books right to your door, uh, in this case in Pollock Halls. Now this was originally envisioned as a service for uh, students who couldn't physically attend to the library to pick up a book, typically for students who were self-isolating or had other reasons they couldn't attend. And I realize it only helps students uh, uh, who are physically within somewhere in, uh, in Edinburgh and you, uh, that particular student, might be remote uh, to Edinburgh. Another alternative is to talk to your professor or to one of my librarian staff about cases where you're not able to get access to a particular uh, physical material so that they might suggest an electronic alternative. We have over 1.4 million ebooks, 185,000 journals, and over 160,000 open archives, and about 90% of all of our library material is available online. I realize that still provides gaps. So again, those alternatives I've just mentioned are the things that we can provide to you to help make sure that you can still continue with your studies. Thanks. Sorry, back to you, Rachel. Thanks, Gavin. Um, OK, so I'll move on to our second pre-submitted question now, which is what are you planning to do about the very common outages of the university IT systems? Learn is down almost weekly. The library booking system doesn't work almost half of the time. The calendar was down for almost a day. This has been happening for over a month and is getting worse. Yeah, no, thank, thanks for that question. We certainly have had uh, a number of issues uh, with IT, particularly at start of term. Um, so the entire Microsoft Office uh, 365 network, including Microsoft Teams uh, and email, was down on the 16th of September, and we've had a few other issues we've seen recently. And then we lost uh, our Learn VLE uh, both on the 21st of September for a couple of hours, uh, and then a week later on the 29th. Now, these issues are all somewhat related uh, in that uh, they are symptoms uh, of both a national and an international um, uh, issue in the case that the cloud infrastructure, what you typically look at uh, as the cloud infrastructure, has been overwhelmed in some cases by the unprecedented demand both on the data centers and the applications that have sat within them. We've taken a number of actions here in the university uh, where we have worked with suppliers, uh, including scaling out our applications so that they span across several data centers uh, uh, and the size of both the application and the database that it sits in is considerably larger uh, than before. Uh, one of the cases uh, that we've had uh, is that we've been able to go ahead and make sure uh, that we've significantly enlarged the space that the Learn VLE sits in, and we're now confident that we won't see subsequent outages uh, in that applications and the other applications that we have in our cloud data centers. The booking application that you mentioned uh, is a different beast. Uh, that's an example of something that we had to create from scratch. There simply was no COVID safe library study space booking application available for us to buy or use. Therefore, uh, I dedicated six members of my development team, along with four student developers from the School of Informatics, and they quickly created from scratch a booking app, which is called SeatEd. And that's the application, both in Android and Apple, and then we also have a web version that you use to book uh, your um, spaces in the library study centers. We now have over 1,700 safe, bookable, bookable and socially distanced study spaces across the university. And I'm happy to say 
uh, that that application is now very stabilized uh, and is being used. In fact, we've we're, we passed our 10,000th uh, download uh, and very extensively used by students. Uh, we monitor that application uh, on a minute by minute basis, uh, and we're seeing that the availability and stability of that app is now quite high. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Gavin. Um, so I'll now take uh, the one question from the room um, and I will go for, will you consider letting students book as a household, i.e. up to six students in the study space booking system? If not, please can you explain why or could this be explored further? So that's that's a really good suggestion. Um, uh, I was anticipating a suggestion I had, uh, I had heard before, but that's not one I'd heard before. Um, so we have a weekly meeting of the study space group, uh, and I'm very happy to, to commit to taking that particular question uh, to the study space group. Um, uh, we held our uh, weekly meeting uh, just earlier today, and one of the questions was a somewhat related question having to do with group study spaces. And I know a number of students are asking about group study spaces, and that's an interesting uh, variant on that in terms of having a household uh, being able to book. Uh, one of the advantages, of course, is since we've designed the SeatEd app ourselves, we can make any modifications to it 